Gail Huffon, one of the Republican candidates in the first congressional district primary, get her reaction. But I, Representative Pappas mentioned uh, making more, you know, more domestic energy here as a way to safeguard uh, that we're less reliant on places like Russia for oil and gas or OPEC. And it's interesting, if the president last night had talked about more oil and gas drilling, he would have been booed by the far left side of his own party. Uh, Gail Huff, Republican running in the 1st Congressional District. Your thoughts on the president's State of the Union? Uh, did he adequately address inflation and, and, and energy prices? Well, you know what, before I get to that, I just would like to say, are you sure that was Chris Pappas on the phone? Are you sure? Because that is not anything along the lines of what Chris Pappas has voted for. First of all, he talked about all of the above approach. He has done everything he could to crush the energy sector and to demonize energy producers. Uh, he doesn't want drilling. He doesn't want the pipeline. Uh, this is, I mean, the person I heard on the phone, that was just rhetoric, election year rhetoric. It does not represent anything of what he has stood for. And I just would like to say another thing, if I could, yeah. Uh, about bipartisanship. I don't know if you counted all the times he said it. Chris Pappas is the least, least bipartisan politician in Washington. He votes 100% of the time with Pelosi, 100% of the time with his party. That is not bipartisanship. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure you were talking to Chris Pappas, <laughs> but uh, the person that you were talking to was not, was not the person that has been voting in Washington. Well, it's interesting. I did come back when I and I asked him specifically what domestic energy increased. Uh, are you talking, you know, all of the above, oil and gas? Uh, let me just your overall reaction on the president's State of the Union. Your overall reaction? Yeah. Well, listen. I've attended three State of the Unions over the years. Obviously, um, when my husband was serving in Washington and and I was working as a journalist there, um, and it's it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for the president to showcase his accomplishments. But how do you showcase accomplishments when you have none? Here's what we've had over the past year under Biden. Inflation at a 40-year high, energy costs that are more than double, border that is a complete mess, enemies that challenge us every day, a country that's less unified than we've ever been. And we've had more COVID deaths under Biden than we had under Trump. Yet Biden campaigned on finding you know, finding a way to, to tackle the virus. And that hadn't happened. So I don't know how you talk about your accomplishments when it's been such a weak year for our president. And listen, I want our president to do well. When the president's doing well, America's doing well. I'm an American. I want our country to do well. Right. But it's hard to talk about accomplishments when, when you have had so few, if any. Mm-hmm. Well, I said precisely what you said. I think <clears throat> part of politics today is one side roots for failure for the other. If you know, if you don't agree with someone and you want the other to just lose and no, no, no coming together. I, I don't root for failure. I was hoping the president would deliver. You know, Me too. it was a little bit. Me too. It was a little bit awkward. It was a little bit awkward when he was talking about Putin will not uh, win the hearts and souls of the Iranian people. Obviously, he meant the Ukrainian people, and I guess that's a somewhat of an understandable slip but mm, kind of an awkward one um and there were times where you wondered if he was keeping up with the teleprompter or vice versa and those things are hard for a lot of people but beyond that i think given the pieces he had to work with when it comes to putin and russia and, and the ukraine situation i think he kind of did what he had to do or could do and uh but the rest of it i didn't hear him call for build back better sweeping legislation i think he's um and i think he has a real problem with some elements in his own party being much more progressive left than they perceive him to be Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it was a very, very uncomfortable place for him to be. And, um, you know, of course, the cameras in there, they're trained. They, they get the speech ahead of time, so they know exactly mm -hmm. what's coming up. So they know to train on a certain senator or a certain right. House member, you know, depending on what, what the president says. So you notice at certain points when he went to AOC or, or of course, when he, when he talked about, you know, corporate greed, who did he go to? Elizabeth mm -hmm. Warren. Yeah, that's all she right talks away. about. Corporate, I mean, right away, the so shot of Senator the, Warren when we saw about corporate taxes. I was, I, exactly. I, I was laughing. I was laughing. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, they, it, it, they this, this is a political speech. Let's be real. It's a political speech. I get it. Again, yep. <laughs> lived it. I get it. It's a political speech. If I were him, I would have walked out. I would have said four words. Zelensky inspires the world. I would have turned around and walked back. Yeah. Because you know what? 
how does somebody like President Biden stand up and talk about the greatness of what he's done and his country's doing when right now the eyes of the yeah. world are on President Zelensky and, yeah. and the eyes of the world are on Ukraine and how we've let them down? Right. How do Let me you ask do you that? this. Let me stay on the Ukraine for a minute. Gail, Gail Huff Brown, candidate, first congressional district Republican. And I'm not patronizing you when I frame the question this way, but given your media background, and your political public service background, I, I think you'd have a good take on this. I don't think there's, there are experts in our intelligence agency in the military that have made a life of studying Vladimir Putin. He's a, he's a difficult enigma uh, to study. Um, he's uh, by nature and design, given his background with the KGB, his ruthless background in business, in and out of politics, his goal to rebuild the Soviet bloc. He's a rather unpredictable leader to predict. My take is I think he's underestimated the fierce independence and will of the Iranian people. You mentioned President Zelensky. I thought he thought this thing would already be over. He's seeing his standing army has flaws. They can't even get the convoy into the Kiev because they're running out of gas and fuel. But he's got more firepower than the Ukrainian people. Where do you see this going? Where does Gail Huff Brown uh, see this going with Putin and Russia? They're obviously going to take the Ukraine at all costs, but is it a successful move for him on the international chess table from his point of view, or has he really miscalculated a lot of things? I believe it's a miscalculation. I believe that Putin is a dangerous, reckless, heartless egomaniac and a potential war crimes criminal. Um, I do not believe that he has any world standing after this. And it's not because President Biden has united NATO. NATO has been in disrepair for many, many years with lots of problems. Many of our NATO members, by the way, where do they get their oil? They get it from mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. They get it from Russia. So how can they then speak to their master? Very right. difficult. Very difficult. Um, so I, what, what I see happening um, is that he's either going to have to go out with a final bang or, you know, the world's going to have to get involved. I don't know how else this, this plays out. I just I don't, don't see how else this plays out. I think that he has played all of his cards. Uh, he's getting to the Joker. And um, how is he going to play that? I don't know. It scares me. It scares me. I it don't does, know. Yeah. But yeah. I do believe that he is, um, he is working in another sphere that is not reality. Now, right. I don't know if that's insanity. I don't know if it's mental health. I don't, I don't know what that is. But it's yeah. nothing that we've seen before. It's the most aggressive we've seen. It's the biggest uh, attack since World War II. And a cornered Putin is a very dangerous Putin. I agree with everything you said, and I, I think he's lost the PR war, if you will. And, um, you know, if he can well, don't put forget, a flag... He sent his troops in there believing they were told and they believed yeah. that the Ukrainians were waiting we're for them. them. They yeah. believed that the Ukrainians were... Were, that they were going to save them. Right. They believed it. I know. I mean, that is a tragic, that is a tragic, it's, crazy, crazy man. Yeah, it's not like when Patton's tanks rolled into Italy or France or Montgomery and they were, they were heralding the uh, troops. All right, listen, Gail Huff-Brown, thank you very much for the time. Good morning, New Hampshire. Make it a great Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you.